Hello, I'm Bill Davidson, servant and apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, ministering locally to the body of Christ in Dallas and Fort Worth, Texas, and sent by God to your house to declare to you the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. First Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, tell us what the gospel is, how that Jesus died by our sins according to the scripture. He was buried, he rose again the third day according to the scripture. Thank God. Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, sent me to heal the brokenhearted, preach deliverance to the captives, recover a sight to the blind, and set at liberty them that are bruised. Amen. The word is not the even in my heart, in my mouth, is the word of faith which I preach. You'll confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. With the heart man believeth that the righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believeth, the Jew first, and also to the Greek, therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by his faith. Thank God. Well, I welcome all of you, wherever you're located in the world, receiving this live stream, Roku, or other devices. Good morning from Plano, Texas. On the set with me, Kathy Davidson. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Doing well. You know what you're going to talk about? No. You know what I'm going to talk about? Yes. I'm playing. Maybe. Maybe. You know, sometimes. It's been five minutes. Sometimes I enjoy entertaining myself uh, playing. God has never corrected me for it, but, you know, my afflictions are for the body of Christ's honor. Is that right? Amen. So, maybe God says, you're going to have to overcome that, repent. I'd be more than happy that the day I'm at a moment of joy in my life. I uh, have to tell you, I bought for seven years, seven years, with the Derek Prince, Bob Bumper, Charles Simpson, Don Basham, I suppose Ern Baxter, and if I recall, a guy from Philadelphia named Poole. Because, understand this, I had sold a very lucrative practice of veterinary medicine and by facility at the direction of God, not by direction. I was in rebellion, yet God blessed me greatly. Remarkable how he blessed me. So, I presume we have to say the real war with this, with this spirit these spirits began in June 1972. Could that be right? No. But June 1971. Right. Right. When you went to Florida. When I arrived in South Florida. I went there hoping to be taught the Word of God. 
And it took six weeks for Pat and I to buy a house to live in. We lived in furnished apartments. But we finally got a house. Just what God wanted, a beautiful house shaped like a star just off of Hollywood Boulevard at US 95. Uh, one block north of Hollywood Boulevard and one block uh, east of US 95. That helped that God was with me. Derek was remodeling his offices or opening new offices. And Pat and I were invited to go at night and meet all the people that were helping him in South Park. So we went. And after all, I had more than 200 hours university level. Amen. And two degrees. So I knew Derek had graduated from a college. Eaten, I thought. Maybe studied at Cambridge. I didn't care. Didn't bother me. I knew Ivy League veterinarians, and they didn't impress me. So I was standing talking to Derek, and I said, uh, Do you have any things to help? me about studying the Bible. Oh, he said, I've been to university. I thought, well, so am I, arrogant. Now, I know people don't like my personality, but God made it to deal with his people. I never asked Derek another question about studying the Bible. In 1977, I bought his uh, Hebrew tapes. I'd already left him, but I thought perhaps he had something on those tapes that on the book of Hebrews that might help me. And I bought them and started listening to them. And I listened to about half of them. And God said, throw them away. They're false doctrine. Jack Turquette, who later left me, my ministry, said, that's the only time I ever scared him. Well, actually, I already thought they were false. And that's why God told me. And they were. Flesh. Nothing but the flesh. So, the story's out by 77, but happened between Derek Prince and I, I've been sharing for about three days, four, I guess, about experiences 
with the discipleship spirit. It was interesting how blind these men were. Interesting. Derek was considered by Derek Prince by many in the in the religious world as a great intellect among charismatic Catholics, Methodists, Baptists, not Pentecostal so much, a group of them in California got a newspaper article and paid for it, put on page, so they told me and put Derek Prince, false prophet. I thought that was a bit unfair. Derek was a gentleman. Can I make a note right here? For, well, for a if you note? want to. Yeah, you, you know, you said that he was considered a, a great intellectual teacher right. of the Bible. Right. And this is the same man that turned around and told you twice that he thought you were the clearest thinking man he'd ever met. That's correct. Just to put that in context. Put that? You want me to? No, I just, oh. the note, yeah. I was going to say. I'm sure put it in context. <laughs> Amen. Love the guy. Now, you're not going to like what I say. And I love my enemies. I tell people that once in a while. And I qualify it with, I love my enemies. So don't get puffed up. Because I tell you, I love you. Well, Jesus did say, love your enemies, didn't he? Yes, he did. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you and persecute you. And pray for them that despitefully use you. James 1, 22 says, be a doer of the word, not a hearer only, deceiving yourselves. I'm not sure we're going where I thought we would. Amen. We're halfway out of time, right? We have 16 and a half minutes left. We can't go there. We don't have time. We do not have time. Yeah, we, we do. Derek wouldn't even talk to me. After Lydia died and he married Ruth, I need to say, after he married Ruth, He sent me updates because he wanted me to give money. I'd given him a lot. In a short period of time, I gave $160,000 to his ministry. Amen. I was so well liked, I got a phone call from one of his business managers, I guess, and she gave me her own personal phone number. Called me any time. I 
had everything to call her about. Obey God. I didn't give money to Derek Prince or Kenneth Bacon or any other ministry because they begged. I gave it in obedience to the Spirit of God. We're not going where I thought. 1986, I lacerated my wrist on a T, pardon me, on a two, two foot square uh, light, that uh, fluorescent light, not fluorescent, yeah, it is, right? Right. Yeah. And I was putting in the hallway of the Smith building. My hand slipped. The thing started to fall. It went like that to catch it. Didn't have time to get the hand. Went like that. Bingo. <laughs> Lacerated it. Looked at it. Little blood. But there, I could see a tendon severed completely, veins, arteries, one nerve, yet little blood. Was the artery lacerated? No. Yeah. None say, of you them saw, You saw that the, yeah, they None were None of them. Right. But guess what? The connective tissue, pardon me, that covered all of them right. was completely severed and there they all laid. And you surgeons know how rare that would be. That all subcutaneous tissue was severed down to the artery, a nerve, and veins. And that tendon right there severed completely. So I went to the physician, friend of mine. I was laughing. He thought I was crazy. Yes, Pat, he knew her. My wife, who's in heaven, what's this guy on? said, he's not on anything. Well, what's he laughing about? He's destroyed his wrist. I said, sew the thing up. It'll be fine. What was the laughter? At the devil. Yeah. He hated me. Satan still hates me. You told a story, a testimony, recently about a thoroughbred stud going after me. Right. And he had me. I slipped and fell. First time in 20 years. Now the, oh God. That's probably what saved me. Oh, God. A little bit rolled over, and here's the rump of this stud about 10 feet from me. His head up the air. That's the wild thing. He totally turned, totally around, looking up at the stars. Yeah, well, God did. Right, absolutely. I haven't told her this whole story. They, a person that was on the fence came and got the horse. And I said, good night. <laughs> My dear. Yeah. And uh, they hauled him to Oklahoma to another veterinarian. 
They thought I was not doing a good job. Although I'd worked for them for years, they did me well. I traded their best sources. They took him to Oklahoma to another veterinarian, which is not unreasonable, by the way, in a trailer. Not a problem with the condition he was uh, involved in. The horse died in Oklahoma. Amen. Guess what? It's the last time I worked for those people. You know, there's a, a testimony you have that keeps coming up in my spirit. Yeah. And during this time with Derek Prince in the 70s, you were looking for the will of God and nothing else. And it, you listened to Derek Prince's tapes, but he wasn't the only one you listened to. All of them. Right. You listened to all of them. And you were at one specific, the instance that comes up, you were at one place and you wanted to talk to the person. You were willing, you were looking, you said, for an apostle prophet to tell you what to do to get out of the mess you were That's in. That's correct. And you went to him, he wouldn't talk to you. And you got in the car. I went to his wife. Okay, right. That was kind of thinking his wife. Right. And that, she said, I'll go talk to Brother Hagin. I never called him brother. He wasn't. A brother, sister, mother, them that hear the word of God and do it. The will of God. Go ahead. Right. And and he wouldn't speak to you. Nope. He said he wouldn't she came back and said, He won't talk to you. Right. I said, Fine. And you were you were as sincere as you wanted you wanted God to show you how to get out of your mess. Crucial time. Right. K D in my walk with God. Right. And this Very is, crucial. Right. And this is in the middle of your, with, with Derek Prince and everybody. Oh, yeah. You got in your car. Right. And the Spirit of God spoke to you. Can you share that? Well, I was low, really low. Low, lower than you could imagine. I'm not one that you could discourage almost at all. But I thought, what am I in? What am I done? Have I lost my mind? Have you violated your own common sense? That's the way I thought. I had no common sense was Jesus. And I shed some tears. And the Lord said, Kenneth Hagin can't help you. He doesn't know how. He can't help himself. Now that might not tell you anything, but that told me everything. Philippians chapter 2 says, Therefore, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Doesn't it? I'm going there now. Yeah, verse what, 13? It says. Or maybe uh, 10. Philippians, after why Jesus died, rose again, therefore. You find it? Not. What? Not yet. Well, what verse is it? Colossians? Colossians 2. I'm sorry, folks. Mm -hmm. It is Philippians. Yes. Is that, am I wrong? What? Yeah, there it is. Wherefore, not therefore. Well, what verse is That's, it? It's verse 12. Philippians no, no, no. Two. What book? What chapter? Philippians 2, verse 12. Thank you. I was looking for therefore, it's wherefore. I thought, okay, I yeah. thought, no, have you lost your mind again? <laughs> no, you, oh, no, no, no. All right, I knew the Bible. Yeah. I knew what that said. Now, what does it say? Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Yeah. And I do that birth. And when God told me, Kenneth Hagin 
couldn't even help himself. I said, then he can't help me for sure. And I don't need to talk to him. I do how to work out some salvation. I could read the Bible. I taught it. But nothing was working. You want to know why? I didn't know the spirits I was fighting. Amen. I did not know the spirits I was fighting and as soon as Derek wrung his hands and said, I don't know what to do with you. I've never met a man like you. I do. No, you can walk away from this group and never look back. That, that experience in the car with Hagen, didn't God say something else after Kenneth Hagen couldn't help himself? I don't recall. Oh, I thought, okay. No, I don't recall. Okay. I have no recollection. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a lawyer talking. At what time? We've got three minutes and 30 three, seconds left. Three minutes. Well, we'll get to Port Lauderdale 88 some other day. But this is God confronting not only the spirits with uh, their prince and discipleship people, but the word people. Right. Canada, Copeland, all of them. Thank God. Amen. Bless God. Hallelujah. Praise God. My warfare is not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds and casting down imagination and bringing every thought into the obedience of Christ. That's my warfare. Although I walk in the flesh, I do not war after the flesh. You found that out, haven't you? Yep. Where are we at? <laughs> we have two minutes left. Two minutes before. You got anything you want to say? Only that, that if, if we're listening to you and, and God led you out, there was no minister that helped you. They, would refu they, they refused to help you. They couldn't. Right. And it was the Spirit of God that did that. That's right. It was only God that led you out. That's and right. he did lead you out. You totally overcame. Right. May 77. Oh, glory be to God. Back McKinney. Right. Start to the method, back to the Methodist Church. Give $100 to the Methodist Church. Oh, God. That freaked me. I didn't even have it. I said, well, you'll have to give it to me after other conversations. He gave it. I gave the hundred to that Methodist church, made a thousand bucks that week. Right. Oh, glory be to God. Next week, the same thing. Next week, the same thing. Never stop. You've heard this gospel preached. My obedience is what brought my prosperity, and that'll bring yours. Glory be to God. You've heard the gospel, how that Jesus Christ died for our sins, according to Scripture. He's buried and rose again the third day according to Scripture. You believe that in your heart, you're saved. Believe that in your heart, you're born again. You believe that in your heart, you're joined to the Lord as one spirit. If you believe that, email me. Gospel at noeldavidson.com. As I look around me in these days we're living in, I question how much longer will it be? Oh, 
and say, Jesus, go bring our family home to me. trumpet will be gone, and only the redeemed shall hear his voice on that day, when he comes in clouds of glory to catch us all. Davidson. I'd like you to join me and the ministers of music from Water of Life Church here in Plano as we minister to you the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus, which is the power of God. It was July 1915. Reese Howes and his wife Elizabeth had been called by God as ministries to, as minis missionaries to Africa. For Reese, this came as another step in his walk with the Lord. He was born in Wales, left school at 12 to work in the tin mines, but at the age of 22, he made his way to America to work in the steel factories around Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, in cities that I'm familiar with, Newcastle and Connellsville. It was in the States that he was born again, but on his return to Wales, he learned what it meant to be to walk in the Spirit. He ministered became an intercessor, 
and now they were on their way to Africa to be missionaries. When it was time to leave, they did not have the money to take the train to London where they would aboard the ship. But Reese Howes knew what it meant to trust in God and to let God test you. There is always a tendency to keep money so as to get out of God's testings, said Mr. Howes, and they had tried their best to keep the money this time. But the money that they had, they had to spend. And yet all their friends thought that they were well supplied. So it was the week of their departure, and they thought the money would sure come to them the day before they left for London. But the mail came, no money. And their train was leaving before the mail would come the next morning. They thought it would be very hard to say goodbye to their own son, little Samuel, and their uncle and aunt who were the, going to keep them. But the lack of the train money made the parting a little easier. The house found that this was often the way with the Lord. When they had something very hard to do, he would burden them in another way to make the former a little easier. The next morning, it was not so hard to depart from their parents because they had to walk to the station without the necessary funds. They felt sure that someone would come to them on the station platform, but no, no money. The time came for the train to leave. What were they going to do? Well, there was only one thing possible. They had with them 10 shillings. So they would take the train as far as that 10 shillings would take them, and then their end would be God's opportunity. They had to change trains in Lanelli Station, about 20 miles from their home, and wait there for a couple hours. So without letting anybody know, that's as far as they booked the train. There were there many people that came to see them off at their home station, wishing them good tidings. But what they really need needed were the funds to get to London. Many also came with them as far as Lanelli, singing all the way. Reese Howes thought to himself, I'd sing a lot better if I had this money. At the Lanelli station, they went out to breakfast with some friends, and they walked back to the station, still not delivered from their problem. And now it was time for the train to come. The Spirit of God then spoke to Reese and said, if you had the money, what would you do? Well, Reese answered back quickly, I'd take my place in the line at the booking office. Well, the Spirit of God replied, uh, have you not preached that my promises are equal to current coin? Take your place in the line. There was nothing Reese House could do except obey. There were about a dozen people in front of him. They were passing by the book window one by one. And the devil kept telling Reese, now, you have only a few people in front of you. And when it's your turn, you'll have to walk right on by. You have preached much about Moses with the Red Sea in front and the Egyptians behind. But now you're the one that's shut in. And Reese Howe answered the devil, yes, shut in. But like Moses, I'll be gloriously led out. And he stayed in line. Then, when there were only two people in front of him, a man suddenly stepped out of the crowd and said, I'm sorry, I can't wait any longer. I must open my shop. And he said goodbye. And he reached out and he put 30 shillings into Reese Howe's hand. As Mr. House puts it, it was most glorious. And it was only a foretaste of what the Lord would do in Africa as they obeyed him. You know, it's interesting. After they bought their tickets, got ready to get on the plane or the train, the people who came with them began to give them gifts and more money. But the Lord had held that back from them until they passed the test. And guess what? They sang all the way to London. Are you in a test? Are you being tested? Thank God. Got a perfect song for you. It's done here by the My Girls. It's called Through It All. Let's praise God while this song plays.
let's pray. Father, I thank you. Father, I thank you. Father, let the power of my Lord be great. Father, let the power of my Lord be great. Grant your people repentance. Father, grant us repentance. Open our eyes that we can see. Open our hearts like you did for Lydia, that we can attend unto the things which are spoken. Turn us from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, and I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I grew up in a denominational church, and I went there. I was, as a young child, I kept my ears open. I listened to what the pastor was saying. Because I wanted to know if anybody knew God, if anybody knew anything about them, if, if, about him, if they would help me. And you know what I heard the pastors that I grew up with say? They said that when you prayed to God, that he answered four ways, actually five. He would, if you would ask God a question or if you'd pray, God would either say yes or no or maybe or wait, or what I thought wouldn't even answer you at all. That's what I saw growing up in the denominational churches. Now, I want to show you out of the word, not your church tradition, not what you've heard from the people around you. We are going to only go to the word of God. And remember what I always say, Jesus said in John 10, the word of God, the scriptures cannot be broken. Amen. They can't. So I want to go to um, Matthew 8. I'm going to read a couple things out of here, and then we're going to do a couple verses. But I'm going to show you how God answers your prayers, how he will answer, and how you can count on him to answer your prayers. Verse 1, chapter 8. When Jesus was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. Amen. And behold, there came a leper, a leper. Now, for those young enough that don't know what leprosy is, it's a contagious disease. And it gives you huge, ugly, disgusting sores. It eats your flesh. And it gets so bad, if, if it's not, if God doesn't step in, that your Fingers, your toes, your limbs will actually be, they'll fall off. They'll fall off. It's a contagious disease. And nobody in Jesus' time was allowed to get near that had the disease to anybody else because nobody else wanted it. Nope. It's easy to see why. But this leper came to the, Jesus and it says, And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, Notice, there came a leper, came. I want you to look at that word came. I want you to keep that word in your, in your ear. The leper came to him, worshiped Jesus saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou can make me clean. And you know what Jesus said? He said, no. He said, maybe. He said, well, you're going to have to wait. Is that what Jesus said? Let's go back to the word of God. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him saying, I will, I will be thou clean. Amen. And immediately, immediately the leper was cleansed. Now let's go down a couple more verses. Verse five. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, came unto him a centurion. There's that word again, came, came. Okay, Jesus entered the Capernaum. There came unto him a centurion, beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said unto him, maybe, eh, wait, no, not today. Is that what the word of God says? No. 
What does the word of God say? And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. I will. You know, Dole has told a story in these last 30 years I've been here that got to my heart. He was praying for a horse and the horse died. Thanks for the prayers, said the horse. The horse died. And Doyle wondered why the horse died. And you know what the Spirit of God told him? And I've got permission to tell this story. The Spirit of God told him, you not only thought that I would heal the horse, you didn't even think I could heal the horse. Do you hear that? You not only thought that I would, that I wouldn't heal the horse, you didn't even think I could heal the horse. What did Jesus say to the centurion? I will come and heal him. And you know what? He did. He did. One more verse in Matthew 8, verse 16. It said, And when evening was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. Look at that first sentence again. When evening was come, they brought unto him. They brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. And he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. What was the prerequisite? What was the prerequisite here? They brought him to him. They brought the sick and the demon possessed to him. What happened with the leopard? He came to Jesus. What happened with the centurion? He came to Jesus. Do you catch what I'm trying to say? This verse says, all that came, Jesus healed. Jesus healed. Let's go to another verse. I'm going to go to Luke 6. And I'm going to read verse 17. And this is Jesus. He came down with him and stood in the plain and the company of his disciples and a great multitude of people out of all Judea and Jerusalem from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon, which came to hear him and be healed of their diseases. Came. Jesus healed all that came to him. You know, I looked this up. I wanted to make sure there are 13 scriptures in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John where everybody, the multitudes, the multitudes that came to him, he healed them all. What was the prerequisite? They had to come. They came. They came. We got a young lady around here by the name of Candace, and she always says, go to God. Well, they came. They came. Let's go to another verse. I'm going to go to John 6. John 6. This is Jesus speaking. He said, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Amen. Let's read that again. And him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out cast him out. I can hear some of you saying, at the beginning says, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And you say, well, what if the Father didn't give me to Jesus? Did you hear the second part of the verse? Did you hear the second part of the verse? I sound like your mother, don't I? Can't you hear the second part of the verse? It says, and him that cometh to me, I will in no wise, cast you out. Does that sound like no to you? Does that sound like wait to you? Does that sound like maybe to you? Everyone that comes to Jesus gets what they need. You don't believe that? One more. Let's go to another verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm going to read verse 8, uh, begin in verse 18. But as God is true, and our word towards you was not yea and nay. This is Paul speaking about the gospel. Our word towards you was not yea and nay. Yes or no, or maybe or wait. 
It said, our word toward you was not yea and nay, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silvanus and Timotheus, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. Yes. Next verse, for all the promises, all the promises, all the promises of God in him, in Jesus, are yes, and in him, amen to the glory of God by us. You come, notice the word come, to Jesus looking for forgiveness. You're going to get it because all the promises in God are yes and amen. If you go to Jesus searching for healing, asking for healing, you're going to get it because all the promises in him are yes and amen. If you need deliverance, and you go to Jesus. Remember, the prerequisite is you got to come. You got to come. You're going to get what you ask for. Why? Because all the promises in Jesus are yes, amen. yes, and amen. Now, how can that be true? How can that be true? One last verse, Romans 8. Verse 32. And he that spared not, uh, let's go to verse 31. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son. This is the father. He that spared not his own son. How shall he not with him freely give us all things? Because he spared not Jesus and that Jesus paid for your sin. He paid, took on your sickness, your disease, your perversities. He took on your poverty. He took on your, your no peace. He took on all of that on his own body, on the tree, died, was buried, and was raised again the third day. That is why all the promises of God in him are yes and amen. The only thing you got to do is come to him. Come to him. And what if you don't get it today? You come to him tomorrow. And what if you don't get it tomorrow? You keep coming until you get it. Because all the promises are yes. I have a great song for this. I've got the Water of Life boys, and they're ministering, I am, you said to me. When it was done in my heart, You brought life to me, a child of darkness became a child of light. And when my soul was so
Teaching me these scriptures years ago. I remember I was praying, uh, the, I remember the whole week praying about these scriptures and others, about Jesus and how, how they would go to him. And I remember telling the Father, you know, I don't even think you can, that you could, that Jesus would even let you touch him. And God, the, the Spirit of God was ministering me that day, and I was in a, a small room. And the power of God was on me, and it was Jesus himself. He said to me, Kathy, reach out and touch me. I said, I can't. You won't. I, I, I couldn't. And, and the Spirit of God kept saying, Kathy, reach out and touch me. Amen. You know, I finally got brave enough. And I took my hand, and I put him out as if I were going to touch Jesus. You know, he wasn't. He wasn't afraid of me. He wasn't afraid of me. Do you know when my hands, they actually touched the wall, but when they touched that wall, the power of God just flowed through me. So much so, I fell to my knees. And God started delivering me from the rejection that told me you can't touch him. You can touch him. You go to him and he will meet you anywhere you are. He is not afraid to touch you. Amen. You're the reason he died. It says in Romans 10, 13, those that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, shall be delivered. Go to him. Till next time, God bless. We invite you to visit Water of Life Church at 1621 18th Street in Plano, Texas. Or for further information, call area code 972-578-8082. That's 972-578-8082. Or write Doyle Davidson, Post Office Box 861327, Plano, Texas 75086. That's Doyle Davidson, Post Office Box 861327, Plano, Texas, 75086. This program was paid for by Water of Life Church.